This is Off Planet Radio. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer, and this will be episode four of our series on the metaphysics of the blockchain and everything else. And this has typically been a show that I do with Jeff Gates, but today we are glad that Randy is joining us. Um, yay! It is, yay! <laughs> um, we, this is our first time. Is this the first time we've all been together or, or no. the first time in a while? We've been together yeah, one other time. It's altogether. been a while, yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, and that was on a show on a kind of, it was, it, yeah, it wasn't part of the Metaphysics of the Blockchain series. So, right. um, you know, we, uh, it has become evident um, that, you know, there's within this community, there's a lot of divergent opinions about cryptocurrencies and all of the energetics and um, culture around them and, and the metaphysics. And that's a lot of what we talk about here. Um, and Jeff and Randy have very divergent views of this issue, but there's some really interesting spaces to, to have, to, to start dialogue and have conversations and, that's where the really interesting discoveries and ideas come from. I'm a little bit more neutral on the topic. I think both of them have very valid points, and I have some other wacky ideas about things myself that I may bring, bring into this. But we're going to just have a lively conversation here about uh, sort of what's going on in that space and in our heads about these topics right now. So, Randy Moggins, nice to have you with us for this one. Hey. Thanks. It's good to be on my own show sometime. <laughs> right? <laughs> welcome back. To, right? Welcome back to your own show. And Jeff, welcome back for episode four. Good morning. Yep. Episode four. To me, the number four is manifesting into the physical. So let's go meta yeah. and see what we physically manifest. Awesome. All right, guys. So since we had, you know, at least not on the show, I, I think you talked about some of this maybe on your show yesterday. I haven't had a chance to see that yesterday. I know you guys had some technical difficulties as well, but I'm assuming that that will be up or is already up. I'll put a cleaned up copy of that up on Patreon and it'll go to because <laughs> we dumped the entire stream and went over to uh, Alan's, Alan's stream for that. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, that was a wider conversation to a very different audience. Mm. And um, it <clears throat> kind of goes into the politics of cryptocurrencies and blockchain relative to what we believe is going on in the financial world and specifically to the man of world holding trust. So um, there's a lot of dynamics that, that play into that that don't necessarily go into this because I think this is a higher level conversation. Yeah. So um, if you've been following this series, we've heard a lot of Jeff's thoughts and ideas and it's a lot of times him kind of coming with where he's at with all of that. And then me kind of giving, you know, interpreting it my way and us having a conversation about it. So since Randy hasn't really had as much of a chance to sort of lay out his thoughts and ideas, I thought maybe we would sort of start there because I know you've been, you know, kind of putting something together for a bit, Randy. So I think we would like to hear, you know, some of your thoughts and ideas or what you have to say, and then we'll just uh, riff from there and see where we go. So, coming at this from an historical perspective, I've been following Bitcoin since late 2011, early 2012. And I was optimistic when I first looked at this. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not anti-technology. I mean, obviously, I'm not. I mm -hmm. work in and with technology. And I have enough background in technology to be conversant in the linguistics of technology and the mechanics of technology. So having said that, I followed the history of what is first off Bitcoin, because that's the most prominent form of cryptos and the first expression we see of the blockchain. And... Mm -hmm. The story that lives on the internet of the legends that go back to the birthing of Bitcoin 
feel very much to me like uh, a cyberpunk novel, sort of William Gibson type edgy subculture, um, sort of shrouded in a bit of mystery. Whereas the technology itself is not really, it's not really all that exotic. I mean, the technology to me is fairly attainable, but the culture behind it and how this thing came to reach the level of um, acceptance that it's gotten over the last seven, seven to eight years became somewhat of a concern to me, especially as different groups and figures emerged and the culture did what tech culture always does. It subdivides like friggin' amoebas. So we wound up with, Bit we started with Bitcoin and the origins of Bitcoin inside of the Satoshi white paper, the blockchain, um, the mining operations that occurred, which in the beginning were very small scale operations that really didn't require a lot of special equipment. And it migrated to this place where we began to see the, 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 the yeah, I can talk, the divergent subcultures that went into all the different splinterings off into different coins, um, different modalities. We got to the place where then we saw the launch of Ethereum, which I thought was, I thought Ethereum was actually optimistic technology in a lot of ways because we're talking applications of blockchain going into smart contracts in applications of blockchain that go into real world logistics. So that's interesting to me. Still in the background, there is a subculture largely connected to Bitcoin. It felt cultish to me, mm -hmm. still does, largely because of these legends that exist about the origin of the technology and how that's shrouded in a fair amount of mystery. When I first saw the Satoshi legend mapped out, it was actually somewhere here, and I should have pulled this out. I have a, a Bitcoin magazine, an actual printed publication called Bitcoin Magazine. I don't think it's published anymore. That's Andrew DeSantis's magazine. Is that was, that's DeSantis. Okay. Yes. All right. So somewhere here, I've got probably what's a collector's item now. But... Um, the more I watch the culture kind of morph and merge, and Jeff's much more versatile in this in terms of the culture inside of what's called crypto Twitter. I mean, I'm at, I'm at the very best a popcorn muncher in that, in that crowd because I'm able to see some of what goes on. And a lot of what I saw, again, goes back to sort of almost this tech culture shrouded in uh, a cyberpunk kind of mentality, which is cool and edgy. And looking at some of the applications that I think they were doing, it looked to me like they were trying to build out a much wider platform than just the actual coin model itself. Before you get too far. Okay. Okay. So when I'm looking at this in the metaphysical way, the, the, the higher level picture, I'm looking at all this technology <clears throat> from 1947 forward and how all the systems that we now base our society on have backdoors, are insecure, and the collective feels that in some manner. I don't care about the personalities involved in the creation of Bitcoin because I feel the collective demanded that an up level happened to re-secure some of these platforms. Not 100% solve all solutions, but just to re-tether reality back to something more secure. Um, so at first, and I think we're all going to be surprised by the coming court cases of who, uh, by proof of work, by proof of knowledge of what metaphysically Bitcoin is, it's going to be some jaw droppers on what these creators created. 
um, just a little insight into that that I have. Um, but I'm, I'm ready for more novelty and surprise because um, I don't have the, uh, the entire context myself. Now, um, at first, Bitcoin version one had its original intent. And I, I agree. I, I saw that through Cliff High's eyes and mined it and got into it. And then I shelved it. And so that original intent Bitcoin became uh, the, the one that got forgotten because in 2000, now I'm going to get all these numbers wrong. Forgive me. I don't know the exact details because I I'm, remember. I can't keep the timeline. Yeah. It doesn't matter. We can, it doesn't it. matter. So just yeah. for all your Bitcoin detail technologists, I, I'm just, I'm not there. I'm looking at a bigger picture. So, say that that was in 13 or 14, maybe even Sounds 15, right. that, Sounds right. that the SegWit fork happened. Yeah. That was a fork that became known as Bitcoin Core. And that's what right now is worth $11,000. It took all of the energy intent and, and forked it into what is known as Bitcoin now. And to express what you and Emily and even Danny Katz were going after Cliff, I think you understood, not knowing, but at, at some level, that Bitcoin Core was the corrupted version that is now the mainstream identity of Bitcoin, which it's totally corrupted. Um, and that, that original intent of Bitcoin became a, a very small used block chain um, and let the confusion happen with Bitcoin Core. All these guys are confused. We saw this confusion with Andrew DeSantis's video with Vortex and Gabriel and those guys. They had no idea what DeSantis was talking about. They are money monster, perception, confused, um, storage of wealth. It was never intended for storage of wealth it was intended for use. So I just want to uh, just kind of paint that little bit of a picture that, that Bitcoin was created to solve some sort of structural problem in not solve, but to assist. I don't believe that any, in any facet, any of the solutions that are proffered by our thought leaders in the alternative media or new age or whatever, there's never going to be a 100% solution because uh, the collective is just creating too many different realities. But I see Bitcoin as just a, a little bit of an up level to re-secure some of the crazy uh, platforms that we use digitally. So when you say Bitcoin now, you're referring to Bitcoin SV. Right. It's always existed. It's the original 0.1 version that hasn't been forked uh, to, to uh, it's called SegWit. They, they fork the signatures um, apart from the data. So Bitcoin Core is the pedo coin. It's what Silk Road was founded on. It is what all the central banks, all the, the criminals want to use. And I'm just going to say it, Craig Wright, the, who, you know, I think everybody's going to be surprised that he at least has the proof of knowledge of what Bitcoin is and the original intent. So even if he's not the, the end all be all creator, he's going to be the spokesperson that's going to show us. That is exactly one of my points as well. Yeah. Um, in my notes, what I say basically is if, if Craig S. Wright wasn't Satoshi in the beginning, for all intents and purposes, pub publicly now he is. Yeah. Which I will come back to because that may be more disturbing than comforting. So, uh, because Bitcoin Core uh, separated the, the signatures versus the, the transaction data, they're in the mindset that 
they don't want regulation. They want to uh, screw over governments. They want to coin um, mix. They want everything that the criminals want. And this, even I had to do a pivot on this perception. Um, at first I was, you know, uh, trying to get around the system, but the original intent of this of Bitcoin version 0.1 is to uh, just live within the system and then consume it, not create a system outside of it and get in a fight. Because once you're in a fight with the system, you're actually in that system's game and it's just never going to work in my opinion. Okay. We're going to unpack all that. So the edgy anarchist radical dissembler part of me <laughs> likes the romance of quote sticking it to the man, which right. is how they marketed this in the beginning. And it's what created the subculture underground. Now, in open source world, which is, <laughs> boy, there's a tripwire in itself, hmm. a fork, a hard fork in a software is generally not a good thing because what it does is it orphans the original, hmm. it basically creates a divergent or derivative form that then abandons the original base. So okay, still, but it doesn't. Okay, so a Bitcoin fork keeps the entire history pre fork. All of those transactions still exist on the new fork and the old fork. It doesn't orphan it. From the point that the fork happens going forward, the transactions are just are different. Okay. But the entire history is still there. So how are they different? Are they faster? Are they more secure? Are they more it depends on the software of what the, like in the SegWit fork, um, that Bitcoin core fork split the, the signature versus the data so that metaphysically it did things that I don't even know how to explain yet, um, but it did kill um, some cellular automatons that were running on top of the bill. A Bitcoin blockchain by splitting the signatures from the data. What do you define as a cellular automaton running on top of this? Dios. As well as other uh, life forms that, so I, I don't, I guess I could explain this. If, if you have, if you're triggered by the word blockchain, if you rewatch the movie Interstellar, that's a tesseract. Right. It's a block. Yeah. And the and the the riddle of that was they could do time and space, but they couldn't do location. Right. The blockchain is just uh, uh, a representation to to teach us how to do time, space, and location. And this is where we get into maybe Fringe or other shows. It's hidden hyperspace dimensions of time. So when you, I know people get triggered by blockchains and, and this and that, but I think this, this version of our reality, this iteration is, has chosen, the collective has chosen technology and technology is going to help us bootstrap uh, us into the ability to transcend time, space, location, teleportation, telepathy, all that other stuff. But this time, we're going to use technology. So I just, when you guys are talking about that and the hidden hyperspace dimensions and whatnot, Randy, just the thing that popped into my head was Bob and Ion talking about dodecahedrons. Mm, yeah. Right. And, and sort of like, from what I get, I mean, this is a long time ago now, so I may be imperfect in my recollection, but it seemed to me that, you know, 
the overall gist of what they were saying, you could extrapolate it to crypt cryptocurrencies or the shape of the earth or any of these like, you know, ways we have developed about talking about some of this stuff, but that, you know, things aren't simply round or flat. They're angles and ha they're angled and have pockets and folds. And in each one of those, it's like a slightly different fractal, fractal of reality which a different version of it is occurring. And, you know, that uh, we as humans, by learning how to understand time, space, and location, uh, activity, distortion, all of this kind of stuff can move, uh, in some cases seamlessly, in other cases clumsily, between the different angles and pockets of these realities and sort of weave together, you know, your own. Your own. It is interesting that sort of... Mm, that's when, when, when Ion and Bob and all that kind of stuff showed up and started doing this stuff was right about the same time as the development of the cryptocurrencies. And I never thought about it in terms of that. I was always thinking about it that they were talking about some other stuff. But if we went back and listened to all the things they ever well, said. They basically had pulled it into the, the same arguments about free energy, about specific right. cold fusion, what they called cold play. And it's the same. It's the same. It's the, t I think blockchain or cryptocurrency is the same kind of controversial thing, right? It just made it to the forefront of, of um, pop culture in a way that the cold fusion hadn't because people still don't, the people are still more concerned with money than with currency. Well, right? basically cold fusion suffered the same fate as the early forms of crypto. Yeah, and people. And there was a disinformation campaign that was launched when Fleshman and Pons came out in the 80s with the initial tabletop cold fusion experiments. That was, that was immediately slammed. Right. It discredited. Um, the experiments themselves were discounted as not being replicable. They were not allowed to be replicated again. So this to me, my point here is this. People are still more fixated on money than they are on energy. Right, hmm. like all of this a, argument, that's a all of this error. argument that's going into the debate about cryptocurrency would be a much better spent use of brain power and argument and time if we were talking about cold fusion and other free energy technologies, rather than if our money is going to be on the computer or in paper and gold or whatever. So do you remember the conversation that we had with Cliff? And it was probably the last one. Okay. And it was my throwdown, which basically said this. I can support the concept of cryptocurrencies and excessive uses of energy in mining operations if we can fuse this to a LENR solution of some yeah. type. In other words, one of my problems with the present state of cryptocurrencies, and I'm not looking at this metaphysically right now, I mean, I, th I think Jeff actually framed that really well, the metaphysics. But from my side, the application itself is a failure in terms that there's an inverse proportion of energy expenditure to achieve a goal that to me does not appear to yield any actual real world, real world results. And that is, I mean, we're talking terawatts of power that are being pumped in order to mine blocks. We know it's a wasteful process because most block miners fail. We know that that one success in hitting the pocket of mining a block is much like hitting the slot machines in Vegas. In fact, Quinn Michaels has even pretty much stated that. Okay, so I, I agree right now because of Bitcoin Core, that fork, that separated the signatures from the data, all their intent is, is to, uh, they need, uh, what, what happened because of that fork is all these miners all across the world that are inefficient were created because whatever metaphysically that is doing, separating the signatures from the data, and, and I'll dig into that down the track, um, there, there's an intent there, and the byproduct was inefficient mining. Now, I, I'm with Cliff and even Catherine Austin Fitz. The amount of energy right now for the corrupted version of Bitcoin is pales in comparison to the current banking system's use of electricity. Um, so 
that's not even really an issue for me. Is that because the current, quick question, is that because the current banking system's use of electricity is that the, the current banking system is the same, essentially the NSA is collecting data on all of us for the banking system's use so that it can survive. So essentially all that energy that's being used, all that water that's being used to cool the servers, to still store all the data that's being collected through surveillance on us is the energy use of the old banking system. It's the harvest because yeah, okay. Whether you you consider whatever magic spell programming code usury debt sin all that stuff of the current dollar ruble yuan that has been converted into digital that harvest is profound. Okay. Now, but it's not just the conversion, it's the necessity to know what everybody is doing all the time so that that system can survive. So correct. they're not just mining the money, the energy for money. They, are, they're, they know that their system is built on a house of cards. Right. So not only do they have to expend energy to hold their system up, they have to know what everyone else is doing so that they can hold it up. And they continually have to add effort to keep the thing going. The original intent of, I'm just gonna term it as uh, Satoshi's vision, is not to have all these miners all over the world. It is to have kind of centralized, he calls them professional mining centers that do use free energy. That's in his original intents in all these podcasts that he's doing right now, Craig Wright. It is not for each person to have their own mining rig. So, um, so now we're moving into what a centralized mining model. It is, and that seems scary. That's a big pivot for the Bitcoin Core Segwit guys, because it's supposed to be free and and decentralized and this and that. Yeah, I can't. The original, well, the original model was peering. The original model that this was all predicated on and sold to us as had more to do with Napster than anything you would think of as a centralized system. The idea of using a non-centralized system, which is peer-to-peer, -peer, which is what you would call a Turing system, for instance, which is largely the model that this was built on, was a decentralized, anonymized, if not anonymous, there's a difference there, system of moving bits data securely across networks and the idea of the miners was to decentralize the mining operations and also to afford the initial generation of what you would call value into the system mm -hmm. because there is there's a number of, of points here where where we can we can drop back from metaphysics and just ask what is at any given time the inherent value inside of the system? Because if that, if that output of energy equals something, how do we quantize that inside the system in terms of something we can denominate? And this is, this is where DeSantis' threads come in, and I just don't know that I can eloquently communicate it, but... Well, I don't think DeSantis is elo eloquently communicated. I think he's cryptically communicated. It. Correct. Because he's the type of thought teacher, leader, that he will give you insights and ideas, and he teaches by proof of work. You have to go and research the crap out of videos, music, um, diagrams he's tapped into the first language of this simulation which is symbolism and if you see and hear that signal um it's it's evident by who is responding to his tweets and who is you know attacking or or, or confused by them that's the only way that i could say that i heard the signal i see the signal and I'm working with those that see the signal and it's opening up, you know, my reality to playing with space and time um, uh, in ways that I never thought were possible. Um, now to get back to your, I forgot where, how we started this thought. Um, 
Uh, and additionally, went back to my contention of an inverse ratio of energy expended towards an actual value. Right. So DeSantis, even in those first interviews, was like, Bitcoin will make uh, the efficiencies of miners change the world grid's electricity supply because it will be uh, just part of the game theory that electricity becomes either powered by free energy devices. Now, now the other, that's the other thought. So because Bitcoin Core is nothing, its only intent is to be a money monster uh, transfer of value, of dollars or, or storage of wealth. Granted. The original intent of Bitcoin is to house data, all your music, all your videos, all of humanity's secrets. So the NL NLR, it can't get a network effect until somebody can post in public view the secrets of that that can never be censored never be taken down for example if you post that right now you're able to on the bitcoin sv blockchain in perpetuity that secret can never be removed it's also not a secret anymore well it's, i'm just using it as an example yes but it will reach mass ad adoption or, or network effect, effect because everybody can access it. So now, this goes back to Marshall McLuhan and there are no secrets, just information that we don't have yet. Correct. We haven't had, you know, Project Xanadu or we haven't had a real network, digital network that isn't censorship proof. I mean, Look at what's happening to Cam Camelia Harris or whatever. That is that you mean that is censorship proof, right? You just say we haven't had a network that isn't censor proof. You meant that is censor proof. Sorry, yes. yes. Okay. Look at California. They're removing all of her her uh, criminal actions. Uh, what what uh, Tulsi Gabbard just completely Tulsi Gabbard destroyed her. Yeah. yeah. God, I hate to even go down this rabbit hole. No, uh, let's not. Let's not. <laughs> But I think this is going to give people a chance to see how yeah. reality and history can be edited. Because mm -hmm. all of us in the alternative media have seen the information on Kamala Harris and the Masonic Police Force and all of these things that she's done, right? And we're about to watch that. Did you say Masons? <laughs> right? Well, we'll just hit it all right now. We've seen her connection to the Masonic Police Force, her connection to some people that are, you know, mm, you know, largely thought to be pedophiles, like, we'll hit on that, too, right? <laughs> but she, criminal corruption, I mean, like, the stuff that Tulsi Gabbard is talking about is well-documented and things that the three of us have known for at least three to five years about Kamala Harris, right? Yep. And we are about to watch those things be removed from the internet and therefore the code be written out of the simulation. Yep. And so it is creating a Mandela effect where for the people who never looked before this debate happened, there's one reality, right? Where Tulsi Gabbard is talking about, she's cuckoo because, you know what I mean? She's talking about something that doesn't exist. But you and I and a bunch of other people know fairly well, and the proof exists because we have done shows where we talk about this, mm -hmm. right? You know, like Robert and I went into the thing with the Masonic Police Force and Kamala Harris one time. So that exists, right? So that exists as evidence or souvenirs of the reality before editing, right? Yep. So, but uh, Tulsi Gabbard just created a huge sort of um, ripple in the field because it, she crosses, it, you know, she, she's a person that has just enough mainstream um, reach and acceptance that like people are going to be like, well, huh, right? And it's going to be confusing to them when they go look and can't find. Yeah. Well, it's much like the bleaching of the internet right now, pictures with, of Bill Clinton with Jeffrey Epstein. Right. right. I mean, it's the same thing. It's the exact it, same thing. Theory, nothing disappears from the web. Trust me, there are things I wish would disappear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, including some of my own personal footprints on the internet. And not because I'm embarrassed by them or shamed by them, but simply because... It doesn't appear they go away, however nebulous they are. So on one level, you're talking about multiple divergent realities. Mm. 
that then fuck with memory, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about. We're talking about persistence of memory in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and how human memory and human consciousness are interacting electronically where our perceptions are formed on a moment by moment basis, which goes into the holographic model itself of memory and consciousness. We're right. Really, I have really right. mirroring processes that already exist in the, or, I'll use the term, in the organic. And I come back to that because I heard Jeff pointedly kind of point to the organic reset that I've talked about. And those words are very deliberate for me. So, but from the standpoint of understanding that on some level we are organic in our expression in a human form and that that expression itself is rooted to something solid and concrete in that we can ground to it. For me, that's been the base level. And so a lot of what we're talking about right now, I push back on just because I don't want to move off of that as a ground level concept. More, I don't want to diverge it and fork it into a metaphysics that then loses that expression as a core. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, just to paint the picture, I understand that all this digital technology is going to show me how this, uh, like, I've heard many podcasts lately uh, about how we're probably in a digital construct, but this iteration that we are talking in right now is a is an analog uh, virtual machine, right? It is not lost on me that digital music I do not resonate with, but when I spark up test or uh, tube amps with 1978 JBL speakers, I literally tear up any song that I play. I will never wear a Apple watch or a Fitbit or anything on my person that is technologically uh, screwing up my electro field. field. Um, that said, uh, metaphysically, I've given myself permission and I've explained this on previous shows that 5G right in front of me does not affect me mm -hmm. through the validation of a, a smog meter. And it just goes, so I, I agree with you that, or I'm, you know, resonating, I don't know. Um, I understand that organic and analog is, is uh, very important, but I'm also paying attention to the digital construct or keys so that I understand how we got such deep layered of our biomechanical makeup. Um, like for instance, Cliff was even talking about the test tube or the tube, tube computers are able to compute far more dense uh, numbers than a digital system. What is a tube computer? I mean, how is he uh, defining that? The most um, so I kind of started doing some research. Uh, back in, I think it was in the 40s and 50s, those tube computers, even though they were slow, they were, the granularity in the calculations. They were higher orders of numbers. Way higher order. Yeah. I'm gonna look up tube computers so I can give everybody a definition of what it is. Uh, the iteration of computing that we've lived in in the present age and what everybody understands it to be is post solid state. Mm -hmm. And it was solid state that enabled us to bring computers out of an overheated warehouse. Most, that's most of what the military was using from the 40s until the 60s. But they enabled us to migrate that into a platform. And, and I mean, we had that platform before. We had solid state before we had solid state. We had laptops before laptops existed. Right. You know, I mean, 
Okay, so let me just give people the, the definition here. Uh, this is Wikipedia, which isn't great, but I'm just going to give people a general can definition. Can you throw that up on the screen, or can you show us? Something? Oh, I was doing it on my phone, but I can probably pull the same thing up on the screen. Useful. All right, let me, pull, let me find it on there. You guys chatter on. I will so, find it, and I'll pull it up. Yeah, I, I, but it is interesting to note, and again, this goes back to an argument that I've had, because as you know, I'm an analog fan too, but yeah. coming at music i'm using these machines i don't know if i can show you this or not this is a sony walkman mini disc <laughs> yeah. recorder and player literally solid state electronics magneto optical music mm -hmm. system this is a recorder i can plug a mic into it i had it run off of an optical cable Mm -hmm. off of my mixer board and I use this to stream music. Um, I don't use Bluetooth. I don't use anything that's airborne. This is hardware. This, mm -hmm. is, this is analog for all intents and purposes, although it translates into binary. My argument about this is the reproduction on this exceeds anything we have right now as high definition digital audio because there is a magnetic component to it because it is reading magnetically. It's writing with a laser, then reading, reading magnetically. Now, I can't prove that with physics. I can only prove that by what I hear yeah. and what I feel. There's a resonance pattern that comes off of it where the music is warmer, despite the fact that it arrived onto the unit and was delivered off of the unit as, as digital, binary. Yep. Okay, a couple, uh, quick, quickly, I wanna say, um, what you were both talking about, like, right? One of the things, I mean, obviously we know I'm a sound and emotion junkie and that's why I like the techno music and whatever. And even a lot, a lot of that music at this point sure. is created on computers. It is, have a different quality than the stuff that was more analog, you know, early on. But no, I've still, the, the parties that have the best sound systems and where everything sounds the best, there's no Bluetooth speakers or any of that kind of stuff. They use old system, you know, there, there might be newly developed speakers, but they're all, plug in, uh, you know, name plug in models, you know, there's, I'm sure that there are some festivals now that are using cordless and, you know, things like that. It doesn't sound the same, right? Mm -hmm. There has to be, oh, it, know it, you know, that, that touch with the analog, you know, or kind of thing that you're talking about to really create any sort of feeling and emotion. Okay. I've brought up what we were talking about here. So I'm going to screen share. Let's see here. So I looked up tube computer. And this is what comes up. It's actually a vacuum tube computer mm -hmm. and a vacuum tube computer now termed a first generation computer is a computer which uses vacuum tubes for logic circuitry. Although superseded by second generation transistorized computers, vacuum tube computers continued to be built into the 1960s. These computers were mostly one of a kind designs. And I think that thing right there, one of a kind designs, right, is like that. That's what we're talking about. Everything with, as we have become more digital and more technological in nature, things have become homogenized and mass produced and whatnot. And there doesn't exist this one of a kind thing that has a unique signature anymore. And I think that is the quality that we are all sort of speaking about. And I just want to show people also quickly what some of these, let me see if I can do this. So here. these tube computers are interesting because there's a whole aesthetic to it in the way that- Do you guys still see what I'm showing? Sorry. Mm -hmm. This is what they look like. Look how different, they, they all have similarities, but they all look a little different. Go ahead, Randy, I'm sorry. No, I mean, there's a whole art to this because this is pre-solid state, even in the design of the circuits themselves and how they deployed current through the different components of these, these chassis. Um, the tubes themselves were not inconsiderable. I mean, you're talking about a vacuum tube, you're talking about passing electrical through a gas atmosphere in order to uh, mitigate amplitude in an electrical circuit. Look at this. This thing is called the Decatron tube computer, right? And it's uh, cyberpunk. That was how we started this conversation. And we mm. talked about dodecahedrons. I wonder if this is a computer that considers all of that kind of stuff. Look at this. See, I kind of suspect, and these were actually, now, my earliest computer that I remember would have been an IBM Univac. We had a punch, punch card computer when I was in high school. 
those were not solid state. They weren't tube computers the way that's designed, but some components of it used uh, tube components. I mean, IBM modula modularized their systems. But those computers are very much the punk aesthetic. They're very much uh, custom designs. And those are computers that I actually think are capable of tapping into what Jeff's talking about in terms of this whole space-time thing. Mm -hmm. Because again, my biggest issue with binary on one level is what I call flat screening, where everything just becomes a composite substrate that appears to have life but has no life in terms of its vibrancy, its frequency, its signal. Um, that's really hard to explain. It's like, but to explain that, look at Interstellar when they're right. they go close to the wormhole. It's a two D wormhole, but if you blow it up to three D, it's actually a globe. And same with the new Star Trek, or it's not Star Trek. It's the take uh, the inner uh, the comedian one, um, where the oh I can't remember the name of it. Um, he does Family Guy. Um, gosh. Matt Groening. No, no, not Matt no, no, um, um, It's Seth, the... Seth it, MacFarlane? MacFarlane, yeah. That, that parody of Star, Star Trek, they go, they're in space and they see the two-dimensional civilization mm -hmm. and, and they, they play with that in, in that they, like you were saying, your, your term, they flat screen themselves to interact with that civilization and they come back out of it. That, that's the two. See, what's interesting um, about the original Star Trek was that was all pre-solid state for the most part. I mean, there was solid state in the 60s. It was coming in. We had transistors. But the concepts behind Star Trek itself are still rooted in that first era of computing. And it, it's not lost on me that because Gene Roddenberry was associated with the nine, that the metaphysics behind that early, those early Star Trek shows probably were tapping into what those psychics remote viewers were doing in the background with computers in that time, because there was a technological overlay that, that swung into the psychic world with the nine if you go back and you look at that mm. so you know i think the earlier era it's like film when you look at a film camera and i don't want to drag this in this whole analogy out too far but i've i did extensive i've got thousands of um photographs that i did in 35 millimeter largely ectochrome uh transparencies where there is no comparable resolution in the digital world for that. No matter how many pixels they throw at it, they can't replicate the color, nor, the, nor can they replicate the detail found in the grain, the emulsions of the films themselves. That does not transfer into the digital realm. And it's kind of like that. That's what, that is an analogy for me to say that if we have to have a base level at least from the organic standpoint, the body rooted to the earth <laughs> is our reference point. Okay, the, the, the analogy I'm getting from this is like um, the difference between going to a fine restaurant and tasting a meal made by a, 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 you know, a, a high-level high chef and just watching him on TV on Beat Bobby Fly or, or on Top Chef, right? Mm. And mm. Look how satisfied people are with watching people eat yummy food on TV. Right. Oh, it's pornography, so, basically. so it's kind of the diff. That I think that's the that's the what we're describing here is the difference between eating the meal, getting to experience the meal, and just admiring the appearance of the meal. Yeah, and whether that's a fair comparison or not, I'm not using it. When I say divergent, and that's kind of where we started this conversation, I think what I'm saying on the most base level is. I can see the romance behind the crypto culture, the cyber culture, 
the digital binary culture, my biggest concern is that we're moving through time here without reference points back to something that if it's not the original, it's at least close enough to the original that we don't have the copy of the copy of the copy of the copy. And because in digital, we know that we can make perfect copies. That was sort of the trip fall of the recording industry when digital came out and try as hard as they could with, with serial copyright protections and stuff. They couldn't stop the beast of MP3, which was replicating music because the kids didn't care because they had no, my kids didn't care. My kids grew up in a digital area and they're like, they're still clueless as to why dad still has a closet for records and two turntables mm -hmm. and an old aunt because we grew up in an era when analog was God in music, and we understand there's something in us that resonates with that at a very deep level. I think this is all game theory in that I do too. When, when somebody says uh, everything's been done, nothing's new, I disagree because universe is just learning from itself by all of our creation, novelty, and surprise. If that's, that process is finished, why is this simulation even here? So I think we as human creators still create things that are new through this chaos per se. Now, we, we knew analog, we knew, look at the mud flood area or era. Those, those buildings have secrets of technology in them that are, are just undecipherable at this point for us um, but clearly there was novelty and surprise back then um, and we instead of trying to hang on to that whatever this game theory is playing out um, even Instagram I'm seeing Instagram is not fast enough for these kids I think this is this little confusion this chaos is going to lead so that's how you're getting to TikTok right now. I mean, basically, that's the, the next level pl platform is TikTok. Right. Yeah. But even that's going to lead to, it's just not going to be fast enough. We are going to want telepathy. We are going to want teleportation, um, telekinesis. It, I just, that's where I kind of okay, see. So going. let me stop you there for a minute, because the presumption is that we don't already have that. And the presumption is that we need to do this through a technology other than our own body, mind, soul, silo. You and I know that, but for some reason, the collective as a whole is, needs to go through some sort of... Middleman, it's like religion. You need to go through the, the priest to get to God. I, the technology I don't know that is the middleman. I don't know the context of what this collective is going through. It's frustrating to watch because we already know what kind of end goals we want, but we're in a collective so that has the majority manifestations. All three of us here, at, in very different ways, experience extraordinary things and travels. <laughs> and psychic, you know, you do it with the work that you do, mm -hmm. I have a slightly different version of that mm -hmm. and where I travel and what I see and what I experience. And Emily has her own method of doing this as well. And I think those of us who are conscious of this and are operating in it and have made a discipline of it, understand that we don't need external technology to do this. The impetus for the inner journey, which is really the core of, ex of what we do on the show, is to point back into the one, which is here, which is embodied in this. And this is why I go divergent. It's why I push back is because like the copy of the copy of the copy, the copy no longer knows it's a copy of a copy of a copy. Mm -hmm. This goes into the NPC loop 
of exactly what is real, quote, and what is unreal, and how do you differentiate the organic from the synthetic, and at what point does the synthetic absorb the organic in a consciousness black hole? Okay, so I can speak to that in two ways. Bitcoin Core did the fork, separated the SegWit signatures. So the 21 million Bitcoin cores that will ever be created, uh, really that, that ledger is unspent transaction outputs, UTXOs. Those unspent transactions in that specific blockchain ledger lost the ability to be fractals as opposed to the Bitcoin SV blockchain with only 20, we're at 18 million, there'll only be 21, but every time more and more of those are created, those are fractals, that, that's the mandala. So um, when, when De DeSantis and those guys are talking about the cellular automatons on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, Bitcoin SV blockchain, those, those simulated uh, sims that are going to get created from all of our interactions with that, those are not fractals of me. Those are um, characters that I am going to um, control. So I, I would bring that back to my, rea my interpretation of what's going on in, in the simulation. My higher self is outside of the simulation. My oversoul is inside. My higher self has fractalized into many spirits to have to animate uh, souls that the oversoul has fractalized into. So I, I'm not a believer that, that the spirit is, is, spirit and soul are a lot of times confused. It's either one or the other, but to me, there's both. The higher self is outside of the simulation, and that's why it knows the context of what's going on. The oversoul is inside and, and fractalizes into many soul vehicles. That's why you get your universal face through all of your lifestyles, whether well, you're man, woman, but you have some sort of similarity. Um, so if I have a fractal soul that's animated by spirit in the mud flood area era, I'm going through novelty and surprise in that lifetime, but I'm still fractally entangled with all of my other iterations. Um, so that's where I see the original intent of Bitcoin is to give you the insights and ideas to be aware of that in different ways. And we're just centering on Bitcoin. But clearly, Bitcoin is going to affect the collective because it has a network effect already in ways that we probably can't see at the moment, um, as opposed to uh, the fiat system, which is just going through tons of problems. And the, you, know, you can say, well, the, uh, the administration of this simulation wants something new to control us. But I just see it as something. But how different. less of a how less of a fiat system is Bitcoin really than the official fiat system? And this is this is where it gets into another abstraction layer. It's much like okay, from the standpoint you you split over so and higher self, whereas I don't. I see that as one construct, and I see higher self. <clears throat> oversoul outside of the construct, whereas the expressions, the aspect selves operate within sort of this three-dimensional linear construct we call the world. Mm. God, I just lost myself in my own thought now. So... <laughs> artifice, if there's a very psychedelic aspect to this, kids. The yeah. artifice to this is that, and this came up in the conversation that we had yesterday. And it's something that I've challenged even with the man of world holding trust and what they're supposedly doing or any other liberation technology right now is 
are we losing anchor to an actual real expression of a thing versus something that is being intentionally synthesized so that it can be manipulated? The absolute value of money is meaningless. Hmm. Only anchor it today to relative values of things that are in the marketplace, which are in flux, and most of which are controlled and manipulated at an extraordinary level. So when I look at the logic of Bitcoin, Bitcoin says what? There's how many? 21 million? Correct. It's the cap off. So cap. at that point, you then have what was pointed out to me on Twitter this week as scarcity. In other words, beyond that 21 million, there, there's no new ones. There's nothing new produced within that system, which appears to be the opposite of an inflationary fiat system. So humor me here for a minute. Is it? Because the opposite motion can work the same way. When we begin to subdivide this, the, the Bitcoin down to the Satoshi, into micro Satoshis, when we move zeros further and further to the right, what is the net effect of that? Is that inflation or is that dilution? And how are the two even different? I mean, if inflation could be a good thing because you would get more of it, but we know that it actually dilutes. So if we subdivide the Satoshis increasingly and increasingly into micro micro denominations in order to have a functional, uh, functional currency, is that anti-inflationary or are we simply reversing the process and getting the same effect? So look at, look at your, your print behind you. That's a fractal, right? That, that's all. Uh, I don't know how to explain that. It starts that. at the center here and it moves out and with increasing so right. are you saying that right now they say there are the whole there's the whole thing that is bitcoin and there are 21 trillion of them and then with it each bitcoin we fractalize down to 21 trillion of their own Sorry. segments within that and then each one of those further and further and further and then you have the mandala thing so it's, it's a contained self-replicating fractalized system it's infinitely fractalizable okay and 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 so craig wright's blogs talk about the Mandela and all of this stuff in ways that most of crypto Twitter cannot understand yet. But through DeSantis's kids, kids, crew, <laughs> uh, I've gotten hints and glints and, you know, insights of, oh, shit, that's what they're talking about. I don't have the answers, but I'm, and I'm, I'm more than okay with making a mistake on my, uh, trajectory because I'll just replay attack any mistakes but I see where this is going and it's it's just an in a trail of insights and ideas to my end goal is to beat the death and debt program to regenerate this body to uh, affect time and space of my own reality not not with intent to the collective because that violates free will. But I have some lofty goals and it's not enslavement. It's not living or being attached to a narrative that doesn't pivot because I've already pivoted on Bitcoin. I understand that it got corrupted, but I see where the uncorruption has happened too. That so makes for sense. you, this is a metaphysical model Yes. Of a trajectory. Yes. It's a symbolic system. And we would come back to that because of the symbolic system. I mean, everything in the world of crypto, cyber, binary is code. It is. Code is symbolic language. Unless you're, unless you're writing hexadecimal machine code, everything that you do is in an abstraction layer in the software. That's what I do in my spare time. I write hexade hexadecimal <laughs> Machine You're writing content. directly to the core. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we're coming to the end of the uh, public hour here. And uh, okay. when we move over into the patrons hour, 
I'm going to bring things are going to get uh, really we're, wild. We're, we're, things are going to get really wild because there is a psychedelic aspect to all of this yeah. that hasn't uh, that I think that somewhere intuitively we're all sort of aware of, but we haven't really explored from that angle. And something came to my attention that made me think about this. And I'm like, this is really where the juice is at. So leave it to Emily to bring the psychedelics into it. But that's where we're going to go with okay. some of this and, in the, in the and second And I also, hour. I want to touch on this AI demon thing in the second hour. Yeah, yeah, no, we need to go there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about mushrooms and monsters in the second hour. Right. And, <laughs> so if you guys haven't already joined us at patreon.com forward slash off planet media, please do. You'll be able to see the second hour of the show. And we really appreciate our patrons and all the support that you've given us. It enables us to do this and so much more. So anything either one of you guys want to leave us with in the first hour? No, be able to see. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, we're going to take a quick potty break and we'll see you on the other side. This is off planet radio. Bye. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.